Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Santoro, Director of Programming at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. On behalf of Nickham Foundation, we first want to extend our sincerest thanks to the healthcare and essential workers on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic for keeping us safe. This is a challenging time, and our goal today is to share information and evidence-based strategies to manage loneliness and increase well-being. Prior to COVID-19, 20% of the population experienced loneliness and social isolation. And our current world of physical distancing and quarantine restrictions has only heightened these feelings. A lack of meaningful social connections can have a serious impact on an individual's mental and physical health. Fortunately, the science of happiness provides insights into how intentional actions and strengthen social connections boost happiness and, in turn, health and well-being. To explore strategies to address loneliness and improve social connection, we're so pleased to have a prestigious panel of experts with us today. Before we hear from them, I want to thank Nickham's president and CEO, Nancy Chalkley, and the Nickham team who helped to convene this event today. You can find biographical information for all of our speakers along with today's agenda and copies of slides on our website. We also invite you to live tweet during the webinar today using the hashtag COVIDWellbeing. I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Don Berwick. Don began his career as a pediatrician and is a leading authority on healthcare quality and improvement. He is a former administrator of CMS and currently serves as President Emeritus and Senior Fellow of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which he co-founded. Don also serves as an advisor to Nickum, and we're so fortunate to have him with us today. Don? Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for the chance to join, uh, join you all. I'm stunned by the level of interest in this topic, and I can't wait to hear my co-speakers. Um, and let me also extend my thanks to Nancy Chalkley for her incredible leadership of Nickham and Nickham Foundation. It's a privilege to be associated with this great education and research organization. Uh, I'm going to basically lay a groundwork. My colleagues are going to, I think, offer the good news. I'm going to start with some of the bad news. I want to talk a bit about the challenges we have around happiness, health, and well-being, and especially social isolation, and give you a little bit of a peek at the scientific underpinnings of the problem we're trying to solve. I want to defer, uh, I want to uh, give credit to my mentor, Sir Michael Marmot uh, from the UK. Uh, Michael is um, one of the world's experts on the issues we're dealing with, basically the uh, social determinants of health. And if you have not read uh, Sir Michael's book uh, called The Health Gap, which appeared in 2015, it is my text, my Bible on this field. It's a wonderful book and it lays out not just uh, issues around happiness, isolation, and, and well-being, but also the greater terrain of what we, we really now call uh, social determinants of health. Um, social determinants of health is a widely used term right now. You're hearing it a lot. Uh, the question is, what does it mean? And that's what I want to unlayer and what I want to connect back to our topic today about isolation, loneliness, health, and well-being. Um, the, the, the phenomenology is disturbing. We, we know from research, this most recent paper, especially by uh, Steve, Steve Wolf uh, and uh, Heidi Schumacher that appeared in JAMA, but it really summarizes uh, growing epidemiologic data on life expectancy, mortality, and well-being in the United States. And the basic news is we have lost ground. Uh, for the first time in my lifetime, uh, life expectancy decreased for people in their middle, middle years in the United States. That got leveled off last year, but for the three prior years, for the first time in, 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 on record, life expectancy decreased uh, steadily. Uh, and that, that's not an accident, uh, nor is it minimal. Uh, the, the overall pattern of life expectancy uh, has, uh, has taken a turn. It, it's important, though, to realize that life expectancy growth has always been an unevenly distributed um, a benefit in the growth of American society. This graph between the 1920s and nowadays shows that although life expectancy improved quite quickly for people in middle income and the wealthy, if you were at the lower end of the spectrum as a man or as a woman, uh, your life expectancy did not increase during that period. In fact, uh, if you were uh, born in 1950, your life expectancy was lower than if you were born in 1920. If, if you were in the, if you were a woman in the poorest, um, uh, 
part of our economy. What's going on here has very little to do with health and health care. It has to do with factors in people's lives that are very, very strong determinants of, uh, of life expectancy. Let me, let me show you how, how this looks, for example, in the city of New York now, the, sort of the, one of the epicenters for the, uh, for the uh, COVID epidemic. If you are a New Yorker uh, in, uh, in uh, midtown Manhattan uh, boarding the subway, one second, I've got to make this work properly, boarding the subway, say, at uh, 85th Street in Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, uh, people walking on the sidewalk above you are making about $180,000 a year. They're mostly white. They're well-dressed. Their kids are in, are in uh, good schools. And uh, your life expectancy is, uh, is high. It's um, about uh, uh, verging towards 80. Excuse me. I got to agree on this. Messing up my slides. I apologize here. Uh, Life expectancy in that midtown Manhattan area is gone. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, is about um, 85 years, close to what it is in Japan. If you travel north about two, two and a half miles to the South Bronx, the epicenter of the COVID epidemic right now in New York, uh, your life expectancy is uh, is much shorter. The delta, the difference in life expectancy, is about 10 years. That means on the D train traveling from Midtown Manhattan to to uh, South Bronx, you're losing about six months of life expectancy for every minute you're on the D train. About 2.3 years per mile traveled. Uh, that's an extraordinarily uh, big effect compared to anything healthcare ever does. Uh, what's going on between Midtown Manhattan and South Bronx? Well, that's what we call social determinants of health. Uh, it has to do with um, with the, uh, the the circumstances of your life way beyond the accessibility of health care. This has been given even more force, as you've been reading lately, a wonderful summary, by the way, by Atul Gawande in The New Yorker of the book Death of Despair, which, which marks the research of Ang Angus Deaton and Ann Case, two Princeton University economists, Angus Deaton himself is a Nobel Prize winner, who has studied a, a really interesting phenomenon, a tragic phenomenon, which is the surge of deaths in the United States from conditions which they call conditions of despair, uh, drug abuse deaths, alcohol-related deaths, suicide deaths, uh, numbering close to 50 or 60,000 deaths a year now, something we, we've never seen before in this country, not as Deaton and Case have documented it. Uh, this is a particular kind of version of social determinants of health. Now, among the components of this, the deaths of despair, the loss of life expectancy, especially for people who are impoverished, is the issue of social engagement. It, it has to do with whether people feel connected to, empowered by, um, in relation to their society and to others in society. Uh, this slide shows a uh, uh, study uh, published uh, not just in 2010, not that long ago, about social relationships and risk of mortality. And if just take a look at the, at the magnitude of this effect, you're seeing risk ratios. I think we need someone to mute their phone. Um, the risk ratio is like a 1.5 times uh, race risk ratio for better survival for people who are socially integrated whereas social isolation, living alone, and loneliness are associated with a decrement of about one, a decrement of one and a half a fold for survival. That's an incredibly large impact on the probability of survival uh, in, in this study. The, the, uh, a, a particularly interesting study that I showed in a prior Nikom webinar was this one uh, published uh, in the journal Heart in 2016 uh, relating social relationships to cardiovascular uh, uh, risk. Uh, coronary heart disease risk uh, of um, uh, inc incidence of coronary heart disease went up 29% among people uh, who were judged, who, who scored high on loneliness and social isolation. Stroke risk goes up 32%. Those are massive numbers. I want to emphasize, we don't know any medical or surgical intervention on either coronary heart disease or stroke that even vaguely approaches this level of impact uh, of this toxic effect of loneliness. It's a very, very severe cause of, um, of uh, poor health. 
The mediator, we don't know. It's the mind. It's that somehow there, there are connections between the, the, our state of mind and our well-being. The obvious connection is mental illness. That's a state of mind issue of illnesses that, that are treated because of uh, tr treated through, through neurologic interventions. But the psychosocial pathways themselves, the, 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 uh, the, the psychology of loneliness, the psychology of stress, we know are very, very strongly related to physical illness, as you just saw. Now, I have to get a little political, which is why does this happen? Why in a wealthy society do we see this uh, phenomenology of despair, deaths of despair, loneliness and isolation and its consequent effects on health? And the answer is poverty. Uh, the associations between despair and loneliness are not, and poverty are not 100%. You can be wealthy and quite lonely also. But there is a really interesting and strong connection in our country between being of lower income or poor um, and, uh, and, and these conditions. And you can see that this kind of poverty is heavily concentrated in people in uh, underrepresented minorities, in black, Latino, and, and Native American race. This is racism at work, and this is where I, I have to get clear. This is a 1937 guiding, guidance from the Homeowners Loan Corporation around, around um, uh, mortgages, who, 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 who's, who it's okay to give mortgages to. Uh, more than half of the Negro population of San Francisco says this government manual are located in the red areas, considered a highly hazardous area. This is what you, you know is redlining. It's racially constructed redlining, which is part of our nation's history in law. The other thing uh, I want to, I want to, one second. Uh, if you take that redlining and you now look at today at what's happening with poor academic performance in schools or in, uh, in uh, age-adjusted preventable hospitalization rates, for example, the redlining characteristics on the racism map from the 1930s correspond directly to the morbidity patterns and the poor education patterns in San Francisco. This is the legacy of racism being played out through all these social factors in terms of the health and well-being of the population. Um, now, uh, part, of, part of this is mediated by our attitudes toward poverty, and this is something I, I, I stumbled on thanks to Alice Chen in uh, San Francisco uh, last year. Uh, this has to do with, with our federal poverty line. As you probably know, under the Affordable Care Act, for example, whether you're eligible for exchanges and exchange subsidies depends on where you are with respect to some multiple of federal, federal poverty line. States and the federal government use the federal poverty line to determine uh, whether you're eligible for Medicare, Medicaid. This is a woman named Marley or Molly Orshansky who worked in the Social Security Administration in, 18, in 1963. She was responsible for overseeing a project to define poverty, the federal poverty line. And it's interesting to see how it was done. There was at the time in the Department of Agriculture a definition of the emergency need for food. If you were in desperate shape, what was the minimum amount of food you needed? The so-called thrifty food plan. At that time, it was estimated that the average family spent about a third of their post-tax income on food. And so what Molly Orshansky did was multiply the minimum food requirement budget by three and define that as the poverty line. That more or less is still the way we define poverty in this country. Meanwhile, with a very stringent definition of poverty, something that nobody on this phone could possibly live on comfortably, uh, we have continued with regressive financing policies. This was the U.S. tax rate by income uh, in 1950. Uh, this is the same in 1980, 60, I mean. This is what it became in 2016. This is what it is in 2018. U.S. tax rates by income have it remained the same or higher for people of low income and have gone dramatically down for people of high income. We have regressive taxation policy hard at work in this country to continually redistribute money from the poor to the wealthy. The change in effective tax rates is shown here. Notice that between uh, 1962 and 2018, the richest 400 people in our country used to pay 54% of their income taxes. They now pay 23%. The top 10% used to pay 43% of their income. Uh, they now spend 30%. The bottom 50% used to spend 22% in 1962, now spend 24%. We are in a country which is 
which is the opposite of progressive redistribution of wealth. And why is that important? It's important because it affects our ability to, to invest in the social determinants of health. This is Michael Marmot's summary. Inequalities in, in power, money, and resources and regressive policies give rise to inequities in the condition of life, which lead, turn to inequity, which lead to inequities in health. This is the chain of effect that I can't get away from when I look at the data. Regressive financing social and tax policies, deepening poverty and inequality, leading to more isolation, which produces despair, which is directly related to poor health. So uh, this is reflected in our country's status in the world. Uh, our child poverty rate is the second highest uh, of 35 nations in OECD studies. And our, um, our uh, child well-being index in the United States ranked in the 2013 rankings. This has not changed. We are last among 20 nations. We are not a nation which invests in providing uh, supports at the level that other countries do to mitigate these effects of uh, social uh, disparity. Uh, the effect on children is dramatic. Uh, this is the decline in percentage of children earning more than their parents year on year. Uh, again, regressive uh, financing at work. Uh, Health care is part of the problem, not the only part. This is Betsy Bradley's study, which you've all seen many, many times, showing that compared to other countries, the United States invests far less in social determinants and far more in health care than other countries do when you look at the total investment in determinants of health. What we get is what we, uh, is what we have invested in, uh, a, a high level of disparity and the consequences mediated through poverty and isolation. It doesn't have to be this way. This is the uh, policy of the uh, Treasury in uh, New Zealand, a well-being approach can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance, and meaning uh, for them. Uh, we're not doing that well, and if we want to change, we're going to have to understand the strong connections between social policy, redistributional taxation policy, and the well-being of our society uh, through many mechanisms, not just loneliness and isolation. With that stage setting, hopefully not too depressing, I'll turn it back to you, Catherine, and look forward to hearing comments from people that are now actually trying to do something about this. Thanks so much, John, for your leadership on the social determinants of health and for sharing the effect of social isolation and health and all of your insights on the impact of inequity on health outcomes. While many factors do feel beyond our control right now, our next speaker, Emiliana simon Timas, is Thomas will share some evidence-based strategies you can use to improve happiness and well-being. Emiliana is the Science Director of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, and she's co-instructor of its popular Science of Happiness online course. Emiliana? Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be included in this webinar. Don, I am moved and stunned and inspired by your presentation. Thank you for giving us such a insightful and empirical review of the contextual and policy level issues that we're grappling with. And I say that because I want to um, acknowledge the fact that what I'm going to talk about uh, really has little bearing on that in terms of a collective uh, solution to the problems that we're all grappling with, but more is about how individuals can shift habits or patterns of behavior or priorities in ways that can serve their own happiness and also contribute to the happiness of the people that they interact with and their communities. And, of course, the hope is that through this personal shift and work and prioritization, people uh, might also realize the importance of these bigger policy level and collective um, changes that are also absolutely necessary to um, addressing the challenges that we're facing. So just to get us all on the same page of what I mean and what most scientists who study happiness mean when they say the word happiness, it's an overarching characteristic uh, of, of one's life, how you typically tend to feel and think about yourself and the context that you live in. 
Um, it's also called subjective well-being. Um, I like to share Sonia Lubomirsky's definition. Uh, Sonia is one of the pioneers in happiness research, wrote a book called The How of Happiness, if you are really interested in more detail. She defines it as the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. Um, this gets me to also share what happiness is not. Um, research does not support the idea that happiness is somehow a genetic affordance. It's not something that you either end up with because of your family lineage or end up without. Uh, in fact, there is lots of evidence that uh, individual happiness levels can change over the course of life as a result of um, activities, exercises, priorities, and um, uh, we'll talk about these uh, as I continue with this presentation. Uh, it's also a mistake to equate happiness with, in, with specific moments of positive emotional experience. Um, we often make that mistake. Our media uh, and advertising powers that be sort of um, invite us uh, to believe that happiness is about material possessions or uh, accomplishments about um, achieving the, uh, the list of goals that we may have made for ourselves. In fact, it's uh, perfectly possible to be um, uh, an unhappy person uh, with a, a, an accompanying great degree of success and privilege in the world. Um, of course, it's a lot easier to not worry about, um, about life circumstances if you do have your basic needs met. Um, but again, the point here is that if you think that happiness means trying to string together a constant sequence of, of joyful emotional experiences, you actually end up being less happy than a person who thinks of happiness in the way that I shared earlier as this broad overarching aspect of life that includes the grief, the anger, the um, fear that uh, are important when we uh, experience setbacks or difficulties, which often actually end up being quite meaningful. And as you remember or may recall, happiness uh, sort of rests on this sense that your life is meaningful. Um, so uh, there are lots of different factors that contribute to happiness. This is a recent review by Andrew Steptoe. And uh, rather than go through them one by one, what I'd like to really argue here is that every single one of them has a veneer of social connection uh, uh, upon them. So uh, we know, for instance, from cutting edge gen genetic studies that your social experiences early in life and throughout life actually impose uh, an influence on, an epigenetic influence on how your genes express themselves. So if you are a lonely person, if you report being lonely, your, the genes of in your, that control your immune response express in a way that actually puts you at greater risk for hyperinflammatory disorders. So these are some of the sort of social issues that, that Don was pointing to. Um, I could go around this whole circle and tell a similar story about how important our social interactions are to all of these factors and how they contribute to the potential for each of them to actually drive up up or down our happiness levels. I'll share a couple more key findings, uh, and this one's pretty similar to one that Don shared, which is to say that when we look overall at people's sense of social um, trust, um, sen uh, connection, common humanity, willingness to um, take risks knowing that they'll be supported, also holding in mind that others rely on them in meaningful ways for support. What I've just summarized is what would be considered uh, being someone who is uh, securely attached. It means you really feel confident in your sense of belonging. Roy Bauermeister wrote about how important and intrinsic the need to belong is to humans. So people who have that, who have that as opposed to feeling anxious or always uh, wanting to avoid or um, suppress their emotional uh, opportunities, they are at much lower risk, so substantially lower risk of a number of psychiatric disorders in addition to uh, health challenges. So this is a kind of early life social experience influence on lifelong health and well-being. 
Um, maybe some of you have heard about or read about the um, Harvard Study of Adult Development, which for 80 years has been following a cohort of people to try to figure out like what matters, what's most important to our health and well-being. And as the quote suggests, um, the key to healthy aging ultimately turns out to be relationships, and then this is not a typo, relationships, relationships. Um, these researchers just kept finding again and again when they looked at the data that individuals who leaned in to their relationships with family, friends, and community uh, were protected against chronic disease, mental illness, even memory decline, and all of these are associated with your willingness to claim that you are someone who is happy in life. So what's going on right now and what's making it hard for us to connect socially in the face of COVID-19? Uh, first off uh, is the uncertainty, the ambiguity. Being in a state where we don't know what's going on makes us more vigilant, makes us feel less trusting. We, our sense of agency, of, of capacity to do anything is challenged. And all of this sort of is at odds with our sense of affiliation, of generosity, or being outgoing. Secondly, we are facing uh, really uh, specific mandates to stay physically separate from people, to shelter in our homes. This is preventing us from having the typical sort of contact with our communities, rubbing elbows. This typical contact is always giving us implicit information about how trustworthy other people are and how much we belong. And so being denied that, we are left in a position of feeling more isolated, of feeling more separate. Um, video conference modalities, thank you for joining us today as we're desperately trying to use this modality to still maintain connections. Regardless, it is not the same as face-to-face -face interaction. We can't touch one another. We don't have the same synchrony of biological signals that happens, according to the work of Ruth Feldman, when we are in close proximity to one another. We are, um, it's just not as fulfilling because we don't have the spontaneous synchrony that we have in in-person conversations. And then finally, this whole experience of co-quarantining is challenging for our relationships um, suddenly being faced with homeschooling for those of us who are parents, um, being sensitive to the fact that some people are considered essential, some may not feel like they're so essential, some of us have access to resources, some of us don't. Um, all of this is just making it more difficult for us to have those meaningful, connected moments of social contact. Um, so now I'm going to get into the practical tools, some of the practical strategies we can employ to try to correct for these challenges that we have to bring more social connection and meaningful interaction into our day-to-day -day lives. Number one, we just have to deliberately prioritize it. Um, it's very easy to go through our days just scheduling a series of obligations and tasks that don't involve those meaningful connections because they're not happening spontaneously through our sports events, through our team, through our socializing, through our community events, through our extracurricular activities. We need to prioritize them. We need to make phone calls, arrange uh, informal video uh, in dates with our friends and family, and even other avenues where we might be able to connect with people with common interests or, um, or uh, um, occupational uh, focus. Um, one of the things that we can do to make these interactions more rich and interpersonally fulfilling is ask people about what's going well, and that's what's meant by cap capitalizing on positive events. And while we're doing this, uh, utilize what we call active listening. And that means instead of waiting for the pause where you can interject or planning how you're going to reply to what someone's saying, really just listening to the words that they are sharing with you and understanding them in an empathic and focused way. Empathy is one of these affordances that we are born with. and. It gets stronger if we use it, and it becomes atrophied if we don't. And active listening is a way of strengthening our empathy, of just noticing and getting better at taking other people's perspectives. Uh, expressing gratitude is a way to strengthen our sense of connection. It's called the find, remind, and bind emotion because it helps us connect with others who are potential collaborators, uh, people we might coordinate our efforts with to accomplish bigger goals. I have an asterisk because I want to give you some details about how exactly to express it in a way that's most powerful. 
Um, I also wanted to uh, highlight small talk. When you find yourself waiting in line even at a six feet distance uh, and there's a stranger in front of you and behind you, it's important, again, to correct for this socially distanced time by having a few fun, friendly, and informal questions in your pocket to share with someone. Um, uh, you could ask them if they've, if they've listened to a podcast that they uh, think is fascinating or what was the best book that they've read or any number of ways to just highlight that sense of common humanity can really bring back into your awareness and your habit of thinking that sense of connection. Uh, so to get really good at gratitude, be specific and targeted. It involves describing what a person did that you're thanking them for, what did they do that actually resulted in a positive outcome for you, acknowledge their effort, you know, what did they forego, what, did, what you know, energy did they put into doing this for you, uh, and then finally explain how they benefited you. When we uh, share gratitude with this specificity, and this is work of Sarah Algo, we actually cause a greater release of oxytocin which is a neuropeptide that makes us feel connected and trusting and affiliative. Okay, one more set of uh, ideas that you can bring into your day-to-day -day life uh, during COVID-19. Random acts of kindness. It's not just a bumper sticker in Berkeley, California. It is a real strategy for uh, uplifting your own happiness, for making somebody else feel more happy in a given day, and uh, even more interestingly, people who witness random acts of kindness between others uh, feel morally elevated and uplifted and are more likely to turn and be kind in their own life circumstances. So it might feel a little bit different because COVID-19 has the... Um, has the challenges uh, of interacting with people that we're all familiar with. But uh, if you want to get inspired, uh, there are many groups that are trying to highlight what you can do. Check out hashtag COVID kindness, for example. There are ways that we can still go out and be involved in the world uh, in ways that are helpful to others. Um, our, our skills in extending compassion and consoling each other are really important to bring to the forefront in this time. Um, for some of us, meditation practices, contemplative practices, maybe even centering prayer practices that really get us to touch base with that innate urge to care and concern ourselves with the welfare of others. We call this pro-sociality. This is a really important part of maintaining our sense of meaningful connection with others during COVID-19. And then finally, for those of us who are co-quarantining with other people or even trying to maintain relationships through virtual channels, working on our skills of managing conflict is a really promising strategy. This might mean that we let go of anger when we feel frustrated towards a person. Can we think of that person as a human who simply made a bad decision in that moment as we might have in our own lives at different times? And through that, feel a sense of compassion for them having made that mistake and figure out where we can begin at cultivating some kind of shared understanding Apologizing, holding ourselves accountable. Um, we're notoriously bad at that in the U.S. as very individualistic, self-righteous personas. Um, and then forgiveness, you know, deciding that we're not going to hold on to and maintain a perpetual angst and, and fear around a past um, offense is a really valuable way to uplift our own happiness uh, and also um, contribute to the welfare of our community when uh, we have ongoing um, conflict or um, disagreement. Um, I'll close with a slide that is a study that looked at the effects of engaging in the kinds of practices that I just shared with you, um, which I would call socially engaged because they involve kind of connecting with others, interacting with others in benevolent and pro-social ways. Uh, the effect of them on life satisfaction over the course of a year compared to other strategies for self-improvement, which we'll call non-social. So this could include like setting goals or um, stress management and really uh, compare the impact of, of these two different kinds of practices. And this team showed that these socially engaged strategies 
just had more. They had more power to change life satisfaction than the non-social strategies when it comes to happiness. So overall, what we know from the science of happiness is that when we, when we learn about what really matters to happiness and how to think about happiness, when we explore these research-backed practices and activities and exercises that help us form and strengthen social connections, and we exercise them. We don't just learn about them and then just think, okay, now they're going to work. We exercise them, much like we would exercise our muscles in order to get stronger in a fitness routine. We actually can improve our happiness as well as contribute to the happiness of the people around us. And um, this is just really important in the time of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, again, I hope that what I've said is useful and can contribute to your well-being moving forward. Thank you so much, Emiliana, for sharing the power of positive emotions on health and uh, some really great strategies for how we can connect during this time. Under the leadership of Pat Garrity, Florida Blue's president and CEO, Florida Blue is leading a comprehensive approach to prioritize access to behavioral health and improve social connection during these challenging times, as well as ensuring access to testing and treatment for COVID-19. Florida Blue has also pledged $2 million to support the critical needs of local communities. To share more about these efforts, we're now joined by Dr. Kelly Tice-Wells, Senior Medical Director of Medical Affairs at Florida Blue. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it certainly is a pleasure to, to be with you today. And, and, you know, I have to say that one of the things that is helping as we move through this, you know, I understand that because this is new, we are literally building a plane while in flight. And what, what I found to be of tremendous value is the opportunity to come together and talk about our shared experience and uh, leverage the insight that uh, other experts have. And so I'm so thrilled to, um, to have had the opportunity to hear from my co-presenters. Uh, the information is in extraordinarily valuable. And uh, having done some work in the areas of social determinants, one of the things that I am um, critically and urgently aware of is the impact of uh, those issues in the setting of an intense new stressor. Um, so, you know, pre-COVID, we talked about uh, concentrated uh, poverty and, and financial toxicity that occurs. And now we've added a situation that disrupts normal social chains and has in increased that, that financial strain. Uh, it, there, there is an urgency with which we must respond to this for uh, members of our communities in order to be sure that we can uh, prevent what really could be catastrophic outcomes. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we have done at uh, Guidewell and Florida Blue. Um, and I, I want to talk specifically about some things we did for our employees. And then I'll talk a, a little more specifically about uh, what we've done for members. Um, it's, it's clear that our employees, you know, we have a, a company that employs uh, more than 14,000 uh, people and our employees become a population that we manage, uh, both in terms of their health, as they are, uh, many of them are members of our own employee group, but also uh, their day-to-day -day stress, their, um, their awareness. We, we have responsibility for them, and uh, I'm happy to say that, that we take that seriously and really um, treat them as the first and primary population that we want to try to address. And as a health solutions company, we decided early on that, that it was information, and clearly presented information, updated often. That was going to be our key to ensuring that our members and our employees felt supported. We know that our employees want to feel seen and heard, and, and we also know that to be true uh, for our members. So how do you take 14,000 people and, and move them home? Uh, uh, it was quite an undertaking, uh, as you might imagine, and uh, our goal as an enterprise was to ensure that we were uh, ahead of the curve in terms of making that transition. So we pulled the trigger early in, in trying to um, address the needs of a large employee population and support them as they transition their work setting. And we discovered a lot 
uh, one of the things that I have, have shared over and over is that uh, much of what we are addressing in our communities and in our members in terms of uh, social determinants exists in our employee population as well. So right away we noted that there were those who, who wanted to work from home and couldn't because they uh, did not have appropriate internet connectivity. Um, there were those who didn't have proper equipment. There are, you know, many more uh, that don't have a, a quiet office type space to work in than there are those that do. Uh, and so we had to make allowances for and adjustments for all of those things. At the same time, we've got folks who, um, uh, as was mentioned, have now become their, their child's primary educator. And uh, so we had to make some, some uh, adjustments in terms of allowing employees to shift their work schedule, uh, adjust to productivity, at least initially, uh, in order to allow them to incorporate these, these new requirements uh, into their work day. And we were you know, very specific and detailed with how we, how we did that. And we surveyed our employees very early in the process uh, to try to be certain that we understood what was important to them. Uh, one of the things I think that contributes to isolation is, you know, a feeling of disconnection. Uh, so the physical disconnection is one thing, but to feel disconnected in terms of thought, uh, thought processes, um, um, uh, prioritization of information and issues is also very important. And it's a huge driver of the disconnects that can exist between uh, employees and, and management. So we surveyed our employees and then we, we uh, were intentional about responding to what we got back. Uh, we we uh, made concessions in terms of uh, folks' availability. Um, we have people who are working split shifts and that sort of thing in order to try to meet their productivity goals. And then we, we quickly had to make specific plans for certain subsets uh, and groups. We've got contractors, we've got sales employees, we have clinicians, we have uh, customer support uh, personnel, and all have a slightly different set of needs. Uh, we also uh, wanted to be certain during this time that we leveraged and maintained a great rapport and relationship with our employees. Um, and the primary reason for that is we wanted, as we want for our members, we want to be seen as a trusted advisor, we wanted our employees to feel comfortable reporting illness to us, um, reporting worrisome exposures so that that could be managed uh, and so that we could uh, ensure that they and their colleagues were kept safe from uh, the spread of infection. We also addressed very directly the, the potential stigma of diagnoses and made certain that, uh, that we created a dialogue that was comfortable and easy uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis with employees and that any information shared uh, in, in managing that in follow-up was uh, de-identified and protected the employee's identity. Um, also, we had to acknowledge and then address uh, that the policies put in place, for instance, for paid time off um, related to COVID-19 were useful, uh, but we had a number of employees who had very low balances. And so we moved quickly to address um, those that had less PTO and, uh, and made some quick, uh, put some quick policies in place to be sure that folks felt confident that they could have paid time off if they became ill rather than uh, have them feel like they needed to sort of push through. Uh, we, we also uh, quickly identified funds that could be leveraged to assist employees who were in need should they, uh, again, have issues related to uh, new financial impacts. We've been intentional, too, about demonstrating our commitment to employees. So, um, and, and you'll see through the remainder of my presentation that there, we have focused on video uh, conferencing and video messaging uh, as a, an important part of our um, communications methods, both to members and employees, again, to try to establish a more personal interaction versus the um, uh, things that are, you know, sort of print, printed and written material that gets pushed out by email or posted on the website. Um, again, trying to ensure that folks feel connected to uh, leaders and they can hear from the leader's own mouth their uh, concerns uh, being met, addressed, um, and validated. We also uh, have uh, leveraged uh, relationships with uh, members of our teams that would have been impacted as we moved 14,000 people into a work from home status, our cafeterias and, and uh, the productivity uh, of those areas was significantly impacted. 
And there would have been difficulty trying to maintain um, work for, for that group of employees that, that were our food staff. Uh, what we did, however, was that we did a couple of things that uh, kept them working, and that was that we partnered with local um, food banks and did food bank and uh, food preparation rather for uh, our community, uh, producing now 3,000 meals a day out of our um, our cafeteria uh, kitchens. Uh, and the other thing we did was we um, built very quickly a menu of um, of to-go items uh, that can be purchased by our employees at significantly discounted rates. Um, so ready-to-go meals. So you can purchase meals for a family of four. Uh, you order it online, and then you can you drive through and pick it up. And also very, very early on, we, uh, we established that they could also purchase uh, household uh, essentials uh, through the same, the same manner. And I can tell you, uh, given the, the limitations of things like uh, toilet paper early on, uh, we were certainly a, a great resource for um, at least a few of our employees. Now, I want to be certain that, you know, we, we have to talk about benefits, right? And, and, and we did what we should do related to benefits. That, that was not the heavy lift. Uh, communicating the changes, however, is, is quite important. And uh, we have uh, created messaging, revised messaging, relaunched messaging, and provided a number of uh, different fora for our uh, members and employees to uh, ask us questions about their, um, their coverage and benefits. Um, and, and, and that's really key because this landscape has changed so quickly. And often what they're seeing um, in the news and what they're hearing or seeing from us uh, may be a bit different. And so we wanted to be quite intentional about providing them opportunities to ask specific questions. Uh, on this slide, I, I'll, I'll highlight the last two bullets. And, and that is that um, we, again, in trying to be sure that we engage folks in one-on-one -on -one conversation, for our members, we use our nurses and our social workers, some of which had, some of whom had been transitioned out of face-to-face -face interactions into a more virtual setting. We engage them to proactively reach out to members, check on their health, help with food and, and rent and utilities and those kinds of things, uh, because we have a, a team of, uh, of social workers that were already engaged in that work. The other thing that we do is, you know, any member who has a COVID diagnosis does get a, a call uh, from us in order to ensure that they have what they need, both to complete their isolation and quarantine period and uh, in order to connect to whatever services might be indicated. And then finally, very early on, we uh, launched a, a, a um, toll-free hotline that's uh, staffed 24 hours. That's not just for our members, but, you know, open to anyone in the community who might uh, feel the need to engage and connect uh, to get some assistance with stress management. Um, we, we began to hear very early on um, just how anxious um, our members uh, were about what they were seeing and, and their own fears about their health as uh, the number of cases across the country began to increase. I've, I've spoken about uh, how we, we really work to make uh, personal connections with our em employees and members. And, and I want to preface that what I'll say about our, our webinar strategy with uh, the fact that we did uh, do surveys of our members as well. And we have um, uh, paid attention to the, the questions that are being asked. So we created a, a forum that allows for review by um, uh, our interdis interdisciplinary teams what questions are being asked by members and what answers are being provided in order to be sure that we are um, that we are responding with clarity and that if there are questions that we are ha have not well addressed that we can incorporate that information into other communications and other activities that touch members. Uh, finally, I think it, it's key that we um, acknowledge the fact that you know, in this situation we may ask have the same question asked many, 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 many times. Um, and I think that that is, you know, some of it has to do with the anxiety that members are feeling, um, but a lot of it has to do with a, a feeling of wanting to hear their specific question answered, right? So, so rather than read you know, a, a bit of information and glean from that information what applies to me, a one-on-one a, a -on -one response 
I think members are finding quite valuable, and so we're, we explore ways we can accomplish that. And so our webinars are, are one of the, the tactics that we use, and we've now done eight um, uh, hour-long webinars that have evolved over the course of the COVID response. Uh, you know, initially we, we covered very general content, uh, and now we are uh, much more targeted and specific in what we share uh, in those webinars. And each session is concluded with a, uh, a long Q&A uh, session where uh, participants can um, introduce their question into a chat box. Uh, the moderator will, um, will read the question. We get to as many as we can get to during the allotted time. But all of the questions that are in queue at the time that we disconnect are provided for, um, for response, and then that goes back out to all participants so that everyone, again, has the opportunity to feel as though their question was heard. Uh, we also uh, use uh, multiple channels to, uh, to um, uh, distribute our video messaging, and we use small snippets. So, you know, we did specific things about hand washing. We talked about social distancing. Uh, one, one at a time to allow, again, consumption of information in a way uh, that was easy and actionable. Um, uh, we didn't want critical information to be buried in a, a list of new things to do. Uh, we also found very early on that, uh, that our members were falling victim to uh, some scams. Uh, there is a, a great deal of that going on now. Uh, so we began to monitor that and we put out specific messaging to our members related to that to try to help uh, keep them safe. That's certainly a way that we can uh, help them avoid stress and uh, you know, feeling more disconnected uh, if something uh, untoward like that were to occur. You can't have a conversation about healthcare without talking about uh, specific at-risk populations. And uh, we very early on recognized that as elective procedures were uh, postponed, uh, there were a number of members who were not seeking services because they were fearful uh, and did not understand how to access uh, their uh, care provider during these uh, changing times. We pulled all of our providers, called every one of our um, provider offices in our network and, uh, and assessed their status. Are you open? Are you closed? Are you doing virtual services? Do your, do your patients know? And we uh, compiled that information and began to address uh, certain groups of patients in order to be sure they had actionable information. Again, we wanted to be sure that they were connected to care. We also uh, very specifically called out the, uh, the groups uh, who had chronic disease diagnoses that we knew put them at risk for uh, uh, catastrophic consequences from a COVID-19 infection, and we created messaging directly for those groups. Um, and we talked specifically about um, what it is you should be doing in this moment in order to protect yourself. Um, and, and I think the other thing that, that is key is, is we've had the opportunity to specifically address fear and its impact. Um, and, and we do so in, in plain language, hoping that we can then arm people with the information they need to really sort of relax and, and relieve some of those fears, but uh, continue to uh, encourage them to connect into care. Uh, I have a, a, a grave concern as we talk about disparities of uh, seeing a, a host of uh, preventable complications from chronic disease that, are, that directly correlate to this period of time uh, because uh, people are so reluctant to, um, to seek services. Um, we can't rely on, on people's intuition uh, at this moment. We have to really speak in plain language and, and, and outline for them what it is we're trying to address and, and why. Uh, the, the final population that I'll talk about uh, in this last slide is, is the seniors. Um, uh, we have um, great concern about uh, uh, the older members of our population for obvious reasons. Um, and that's specifically related to, to the infection itself, but, but more primarily and more critically is the work that was already in flight to uh, address social isolation issues in, in our Medicare population. And, you know, the, the advice that I have here is, you know, be certain as you look around to partner with, um, with uh, organizations in order to achieve goals like this, choose a partner whose mission is in alignment with what the messaging is you're hoping to advance. And so in our case, we had long partnered with the Council on Aging and uh, were able to leverage that relationship to uh, craft some specific messaging and, and host some events 
which allowed us to talk specifically, speak specifically about some of the issues that uh, the older folks in our community um, face. Again, I will say, you know, being very specific is probably the most important thing. And one of the things we gathered very quickly in some of those first conversations was just how difficult it was for many of our seniors to make the transition to a more digital, uh, virtual way of, of receiving services and care. Um, and I'll say that, you know, ha having, and my dad keeps telling me to stop talking about him in my presentations, but it, having walked an 80-year-old through the download of an app for grocery delivery, uh, it took the better part of a week. Um, uh, I, I fully understand the need for us to move the, the ability to provide that support into a virtual um, capacity. So through a program uh, partnership that already existed with a program called PAPA, um, the PAPA program, I, I, I sort of affectionately refer to it as the, the grandchild program, right? It, it is, it's geared toward reducing social, addressing social isolation, but what you get is, is a grandchild, a, a young person who comes by and helps. It may be, you know, chores at home. It may be simple companionship or playing a game, but it's a, it's a connection. And very organically, when you, when you create something like that for the senior population, those young folks begin to, you know, fix the television remote and, and, and help with some of those digital things. And so um, that program now is fully virtual, and we continue to provide support to seniors in that tangible manner, which I think is, is just critical for them. Um, you know, I have a number, we have a number of employees with uh, older parents who are out of state, and we, we want to continue to leverage things like that in order to have, have them feel connected and supported. Um, we, again, are very, very specific in, in what we do uh, related to that. And I'll, I'll close with, you know, just, again, a final concern, and we're working to address it, this, but it is, is certainly top of mind for me, and that is food insecurity. As supply chains were interrupted, and as our routines were interrupted, as restaurants uh, shifted their business or closed entirely, uh, the sources for a lot of the supplemental food services in our communities uh, literally went away. Uh, and we have had to step in and try to address that in a manner that um, you know, keeps folks out of crisis. You know, that was the case certainly with, with school children um, for whom, you know, you know, some percentage of them, those are their only meals um, of the day. Uh, we had to do the same thing for our seniors. And so we've tried to be very intentional about the connections that we could make uh, with organizations like Meals on Wheels to be sure that we could keep those things spinning for our senior population uh, for whom meal delivery and, and even momentary connection with someone were critically important, both from a nutrition standpoint, but also from a personal interaction standpoint. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing Florida Blue's leadership and commitment to preventing social isolation and all the great work that you're doing to ensure access to care for vulnerable populations. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. If you want to come off of mute, we'll try to take a couple quick questions. Um, we had a lot of questions coming in about um, early childhood, children, and youth, and the impact of COVID-19. And one specific question for John, could you talk about um, your thoughts on adverse childhood events and their impact on social determinants of health and, um, you know, any concerns right now given, um, you know, children, you know, and Emiliana sort of lack of social connection for children right now being, being out of school or having, you know, families that they're isolated from? Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay, Catherine? Yes. Yes. Um, adverse childhood experiences is one of the major areas of research and understanding about social factors that affect health, not just in children, but in, in adults who were children subjected to adverse childhood experiences, sometimes called toxic stresses. This is a list of about 10 originally defined by the Kaiser uh, Health Plan and CDC together things that kids get exposed to that if they have multiple exposures lead to illness and psychological and physical illness, both in, child, in childhood and when those people become adults, the risk factors are phenomenally high, uh, two or three times the rate of lung cancer, believe it or not, for kids with more than with four or more adverse childhood experiences. Among those experiences include witnessing or being subjected to violence in families. And so one direct risk of COVID is we know from uh, that, that the isolation circumstances of COVID are associated with increases 
in episodes of domestic violence, and I suspect also child child injuries, child abuse. Um, and that's only part of it. I'm quite sure that the loneliness that is experienced in families, especially under economic stress, and more and more families are with COVID, also uh, we're down to the to, to hurt children. And many children rely on schools as part of their own safety net. That's where they get their subsidized breakfast or lunch. That's where they get the social supports that they may not be able to find sometimes at home. So it can't be good for kids. I, I suppose Emiliana and others will have other uh, more specific statistics. I'm on a National Academy of Medicine committee that's looking at consequences of COVID. And at just yesterday, we we're talking uh, about consequences for children. And I suspect we'll be doing more on that. Great, thank you. Emiliana, do you have anything to add? A follow-up question was about, is happiness proportional to one's resilience and how can we help children and families develop resilience during this time? Now, that's a great question. Um, to uh, just briefly nod to the ACEs question, uh, I, I would just confirm and agree with what Don shared and yeah, I, I don't have more sophisticated and current stats on the increased rates of ACEs occurring in connection with COVID-19, but would advocate uh, for parents um, as many tools as they can bring themselves to utilize that can um, uh, help them connect with their kids in more benevolent and supportive ways. And in the context of communities, if there are ways that your quote unquote random acts of kindness can be attuned to other families who you know uh, are suffering from uh, not having their needs sufficiently met, uh, this is a great opportunity space for um, alleviating some of the stress and anxiety and unmet need that, that can be sort of precursors to increased um, um, dysfunction and abuse. Um, Okay, now back to the, the question is about resilience. Uh, certainly people's ability to manage setbacks and difficulties and challenges is a big part of, of, of happiness. Um, one of the ways to maintain resilience does involve uh, managing emotions in a more constructive way. This means not trying to suppress them, not trying to avoid them, but instead using them to understand the relevance and salience of the situation that you're facing and communicating them to others, disclosing emotions, uh, naming and disclosing emotions, which again sounds so simple. I am afraid or I am worried or I am upset or I am frustrated. That Those simple expressions when shared with other people about a particularly challenging emotion immediately reduces the physiological signature of a challenge of a of um of, of being in 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 distress and for a couple of different reasons one you're connecting with another person two you're taking a, a kind of um uh, outside perspective on the emotional experience rather than dwelling in it and ruminating upon it. So there are certainly a host of different skills that people can use to strengthen their resilience in the time of COVID-19, and, and, and a lot of them fall under this category of emotional intelligence, knowing what your emotions are, what they're for, being able to talk about them, share them, and then employing different regulation strategies, uh, reappraisal, um, is, is, is a leading one, and any and all of the sort of, of awareness, contemplative, mindfulness variety of practices are really valuable to emotion regulation during this time also, and parents can certainly do that with their kids. Well, thank you, Emiliana. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Kelly, for your great presentations today. Um, we will follow up. The, the audience had... Um, some specific questions for you all that we'll try to answer or, or share with you for clarification on some resources and for more information about some of the great programs um, that you shared today in Florida to Kelly. So uh, for our audience, if you could take a moment to share feedback from this event, there's a brief survey that can be found on the bottom of your screen. Um, and following up on Kelly's uh, point and the great work in Florida on food insecurity, Nickham's next webinar will be on Monday, May 11th, where we're bringing together experts to provide insights on food insecurity and growing concerns during COVID-19. You can register now for that on our website. 
thank you all again so much for joining us today, and we hope everyone stays safe.